Really glad that Jacob uh, pulled out all the stops to make it here today. Um, he is a Ph.D. student at, in philosophy of religion and theology at Claremont Graduate University. He is working on a doctoral dissertation that explores the inherent in unthinkability of the problem of evil in philosophy and theology as central to its status as a problem. I'm really interested in hearing what he has to say about the horror of transhumanism at the limits of thought. Um, and I think it'll be a very provocative and interesting uh, discussion. Jacob. All right. I'll be able to kind of see it here-ish. Is that better? All right. So um, I had an interesting day. While he's pulling this up, I'll tell you about it a little bit. Uh, I'm going to be speaking on, on something called cosmic pessimism, and my day kind of reflected that. <laughs> because on my way here, I got pulled over by a cop for speeding. And then, while I was out here kind of finishing up a couple of things for my slides, I got a call saying my daughter might have gone into like a diabetic coma or something, uh, which was news to us that she might be diabetic in some fashion. So went to the hospital. She ended up being okay. They're still running some tests. Um, she was recently released. Um, and then I finally got the last slide put in about 15 minutes ago. So uh, it, it, it started out being a somewhat of a pessimistic day. Uh, although cosmic pessimism is a little bit different. Uh, <clears throat> so I have a provocative title, as one should have, probably, when presenting something to a group. Um, it's not, it might sound like uh, something that is anti-transhumanist. Can that be seen? You okay? Randall, you okay? It might be, yeah, it might be both. <laughs> this one too? Um, <clears throat> it's not anti-transhumanism. The main reason why it's not is because I don't know a whole lot about transhumanism. So I couldn't possibly speak on the, the opposite of transhumanism per se or, or be against transhumanism. Nevertheless, uh, this presentation is kind of a philosophical challenge to transhumanism. But I mean that in the greatest possible respect because, of course, we want to be... Um, challenged to the hilt with our philosophies and theologies, um, not in the sense that they uh, could be destroyed, but so they could be strengthened and revised um, to fit uh, with both of our need, both our needs and our reality. Um, so, in that sense, it's not anti-transhumanist, but it is um, what I think is a challenge to one of the philosophical or part of the philosophical core of what I understand transhumanism to be, which probably isn't what everyone else <laughs> understands transhumanism to be. Um, I was actually invited uh, to speak um, by Carl, um, who we, we have some interaction on social media. And I've always been intrigued by this group, but I always hung out with like the humanities people. Um, and they're actually going on right now, but I, I um, shunned them this time around in, in favor of this. Um, and in, in so doing, I was able to do some research on transhumanism, obviously just bare bones. Um, I read Lincoln's article in last year that you published. I don't remember the, the venue, which I thought was fascinating. Um, I read the uh, frequently asked questions section of Humanity Plus and a couple of other articles I found in, in links. And transhumanism ended up being something quite different from what I had imagined, and it was far uh, more detailed and had a lot more depth and breadth than I had originally thought, particularly in its anticipation of some of the dangers of developing into post-humanity and what 
could be some of the dangers from the human race, not just because of the nature of humanity, but due specifically to technological development, which I thought was, was really prescient. Um, okay, just a little bit of background of, uh, of myself. Um, as Carl said, I am working on a PhD and have been for millennia on, in philosophy of religion and theology at Claremont Graduate University. Uh, as far as I know, this is kind of a unique PhD, which isn't good for, for like working and eating. But it's great if that is your thing that, that you like to study and talk about. And it is. Uh, it won't be something I can eat with. But um, I thoroughly enjoy the subject. Uh, and, and you study philosophy from ancient philosophy to the present, as well as theology from uh, the beginning of Christianity to the present. Uh, my advisor there is, uh, his name is Ingolf Dalferth. Um, he's the most brilliant human being I've ever met and knows everything there is to know about philosophy and other things that no one knows as well. And I've been very fortunate to study under him and to work with him uh, while at Claremont. Now, Claremont is a unique place um, if you're a Mormon because that's where the, uh, at that time at least, the largest Mormon studies program was inaugurated under Richard Bushman. And while I was there, I took philosophy and theology classes and Mormon studies classes, and it was a fantastic experience. I would replace all of CES with the Claremont experience if I could. And I promise, like, we would be global as a church in like a year. Uh, it was a fantastic, challenging, uh, dazzling experience. I'm really sad that I'm not there anymore. I'm in the dissertation phase, so I, I don't have an excuse to, uh, to live near the campus. Um, a little bit about what I studied. I studied both analytic and continental thought and philosophy, and I won't get into the major distinctions there, but my advisor is kind of an expert in both. And so um, uh, I studied in both areas under him. Phenomenology, theology, particularly postmodern theology, which I think personally is kind of where any theology that, that intersects with what I understand transhumanism to be would kind of fall under the postmodern theology rubric. Um, I study process thought. I don't know if process thought, Randy knows process thought. Uh, if that's been talked about here a whole lot, I haven't unfortunately been able to be here very much today. Um, there's a lot of resonances and I would love to see a presentation or maybe even put one together myself at some point between transhumanism and process thought which is a very developmental um, philosophy that's focused more on becoming rather than being, on the transformative nature of God uh, and, and humanity. And uh, Mormon studies, uh, I'll apply some of that a little bit later in, in the presentation, um, where I talk about just briefly kind of the horror of Mormonism as it relates to the horror of philosophy, the horror of transhumanism. And specifically, I studied the problem of evil, which has always really fascinated me. Uh, I took a seminar on the problem of evil while I, was, while I was there. The problem of evil is essentially trying to wrap our minds around what in traditional Christianity is given to us as a benevolent, all-powerful God, and yet there exists waves upon waves of evil and suffering in the world. And so the problem is, how do we reconcile both of those things? And of course, throughout the centuries, there have been various ways that theologians and others have sought to reconcile God's love and power with the amount of evil that's in the world. And my particular, my particular angle on this relates to my presentation. And that's, that's the fact that there's, a, there's an inherent unthinkability, or there's a, there are limits to thought. Um, and this is part of what I'll get at with the horror of philosophy in particular. And those limits to thought compound the problem of evil in particular ways so that it becomes difficult to think the problem because there are these boundaries or horizons that we can't seem to get past. And so while most theologians and philosophers will focus on specific concrete things in scripture or in the world um, or specific logical propositions and things of that nature, my focus in my dissertation um, is on thought itself and how thought limits our ability to conceive of the problem as it's been traditionally formulated. Okay, I won't be able to get into that too much, but 
that's how it relates to the current presentation. Okay. Okay, now I'm gonna give a, I felt I had to give just a kind of a bare bones. Okay, well, this is the, this is the hum, transhumanism that I'm working with. I imagine there's many transhumanisms uh, out there. Um, and I'm just going as basic as I possibly can, mostly because that's all I can do for the moment. Um, but also, hopefully, because it will engender wider agreement um, in general over what transhumanism is, so that as I talk about it later on, that'll be the basic, the baseline. And this is just taken directly from the frequently asked questions uh, at Humanity Plus, where they kind of boil transhumanism down to, uh, to two basic things, and then they have, of course, um, they elaborate on those at length. The first being the intellectual and cultural movement that affirms the possibility and desirability of fundamentally improving the human condition through applied reason, especially by developing and making widely available technologies to eliminate aging and to greatly enhance human intellectual, physical, and psychological capacities. And second, the study of the ramifications, promises, and potential dangers of technologies that will enable us to overcome fundamental human limitations and the related study of the ethical matters involved in developing and using such technologies. And that's actually the, the ways in which I've heard about transhumanism in the past don't really focus on, on point two uh, as much. And I think point two is absolutely essential because the typical criticism from someone that will hear about transhumanism in the first place is, well, yeah, but what about you know, technology that could cause the extinction of, of every living thing? Or is it, is it moral to want it to develop into something beyond where we are right now? And who gets left out of that, right? And who gets included in it? Well, those questions obviously have been discussed um, from the beginning of even the inklings of something like transhumanism. And they've kind of grown with and developed um, with that philosophy as, as it's grown and developed. Um, so this isn't obviously a new area, and I'm not gonna get too heavily into those things because I, I don't feel like I'm qualified to speak about the intricacies of the ethics of uh, post-human development. But I, what I want to call attention to just briefly with these definitions is how affirming and positive they are, which, which is great, right? And obviously that's going to be the context of when I talk about um, human thought and from a more pessimistic angle. And again, not to endorse some sort of pessimism as like, that's my personal philosophy about the world necessarily. Um, but to throw out what I think are the more provocative in-depth challenges to a view that is inherently uh, positive about humanity, which I think transhumanism is. I mean, it, knows, it understands there's dangers associated with, with this sort of thinking, but at the same time, I think overall, it's a very affirmative uh, philosophy uh, about the human race and its future. Okay, um, a few books that I'll be going, that are kind of my baseline for this, okay? Um, this is the Horror of Philosophy series by an author by the name of Eugene uh, Thacker, who is a professor at the New School in New York. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Actually, I didn't notice that. Good. Good thing I'm about eight minutes away from the end, so. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. <laughs> no, this is actually good. I, this is not the beginning of it. I mean, this is probably a third of the way through, so, so you're good. Okay, now these books basically form the baseline of what I'm going to talk about today. Okay, and they basically hit on what he calls the horror philosophy, which we'll talk about in a moment, which he looks at through philosophy proper, supernatural horror and fiction, and a kind of a combination of the two in the final book. Okay, also... Nihil Unbound from Ray Brassier, which looks at nihilism. Uh, one of the most important books on nihilism in the last 50 years, easily, and also one of the most difficult philosophy books I've ever read, uh, which is why I've started over four times on it, because it's really hard. And then finally, The Conspiracy Against the Human Race from Thomas Ligotti, who's a horror writer. Uh, this is an unflinchingly, despairingly pessimistic book, which I don't recommend you read if you're in a particular mood. <laughs> Um, he, he, he's, he's completely unsparing uh, in his understanding as, uh, as humanity as inherently worthless and inherently meaningless. And, and I agree, I, I laughed as well when I read the back cover 
but he makes a compelling argument. Not, not in the sense that now I'm persuaded that everything's meaningless, I'm going to throw myself off a cliff, but in the sense that it's a challenge to how we develop meaning um, in human communities. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, the world, according to Thacker, Ligotti, Brassier, and other nihilists, uh, is inherently unthinkable on a lot of levels. One, because the, there's so much about the world that continues to be strange. So we learn more and more about the world scientifically. We talk about our lives and the world narratively. Um, we paint the world through art. And we develop greater and greater understandings of the world, but that doesn't seem to erase the strange. In fact, in some ways, it makes the strangeness that much more poignant and that much more visible to us. Okay, there's a mystery and strangeness about the world, which isn't necessarily good or bad, but that remains with us. Okay, and so in that sense, the world isn't completely thinkable. Okay, uh, the other thing about the unthinkableness of the world is how we encounter catastrophe. Um, we're constantly being, we're constantly confronting climate change and wars and other kinds of disasters, p potential cosmic disasters. Okay. In theory, we could come up with technology that could help mitigate against those sorts of things. But generally speaking, anything that's living is constantly being confronted with its own extinction. Okay. Whether it develops technology that causes its own extinction or not. Okay. So these two things kind of make up how the world is ultimately unthinkable. Okay. Now, the horror philosophy is essentially the, thought that the baseline principle of philosophy, after Leibniz and Kant in particular, is the principle of sufficient reason, which essentially states that there's a reason why everything happens. Okay? That's the basis of thinking, that there's a cause for everything. Now, we might not know the cause right now, but we, we are absolutely certain that there is one, and that given enough time, given enough technology, given enough thought and research, we'll figure out what that cause is. Or if there are causes that are, that are mysterious to us, we'll understand what those are. Okay. The horror of philosophy is to consider that the principle of sufficient reason is false. That there is not a cause for everything that happens, or there's not one that we could possibly know. Okay. There might be, uh, we might understand intermittent causes, but ultimate causes or other kinds of causes, we couldn't possibly, we couldn't possibly know. Okay. And so the principle of sufficient reason, if it's undermined, then everything that follows is, uh, comes into question. Okay. Okay, and then finally, the idea of extinction. Now, this isn't just the idea that no matter what we do, according to some astrophysicists, we're all going to die. Even if we somehow figure out immortality, the universe is gonna have its heat death or the big crunch or whatever, okay? We got maybe, maybe if we're lucky, 100 trillion years, and then, it, then we're toast. And it doesn't matter what we develop into, okay? At some point, that thing that we develop into is going to go away and never return, okay? Um, now, I don't have time to get into the, the nuances of this. Ray Brassier's book, Nihil Unbound, is all about the idea of extinction, and it's ridiculously complex. But needless to say, that's part of the unthinkability of the world, this thought of that no matter what we do, we can't ultimately stave off extinction, okay? Okay, question of nihilism. This is, this is Brassier. The unavoidable corollary of the realist conviction that there is a mind-independent reality, which despite the presumptions of human narcissism is indifferent to our existence and oblivious to the values and meanings which we would drape over it in order to make it more hospitable. Okay, this is the thought, which I think I connect up. Okay, on the next slide. This is the thought essentially that there is a reality out there that no matter how we uh, manipulate it, and use it to our benefit to further our own existence or our own understanding of the world that is utterly indifferent to us. Um, and that, put in perspective, makes our existence much more humble than it really is, okay? Uh, and our place in the universe, et cetera. Okay, I'm gonna kind of move somewhat quickly through some of these, okay? Now, <clears throat> I probably won't get, be able to read this entire quote, but basically, Ligotti here, I'm, I'm comparing the, the first two notions of transhumanism at the very beginning, which I said were very affirmative, very positive, with Ligotti's thought. And Ligotti specifically speaks about transhumanism, which I didn't actually know until about four days ago when I got to this part of the book. <laughs> okay, and he has like 
12 pages on transhumanism, which, wow, really, okay. Um, and he has a lot of different problems with transhumanism, obviously, but the, his baseline problem with transhumanism is essentially that it's too optimistic, that it has no real basis for its optimism. Okay, I mean, it, it feels good to be optimistic like that, and we want to, I, we, we don't even know how human communities could progress without some kind of optimism that they'll survive and get better, okay? But nevertheless, he says, yeah, well, that makes, that, that's, that's a nice feeling, that's a great distraction, but the reality could be that none of this is, warrants the optimism that is clearly inherent in a philosophy like transhumanism, okay? Which leads, Briefly, kind of a preface into the end, which is the inherent optimism of Mormonism, right? Which is sometimes irritatingly optimist, <laughs> right? I mean, so thoroughgoingly optimist that sometimes you wonder if, if, if Mormon thought can really deal with reality on the ground, right? <laughs> and I, I ran into this all the time doing, in, in Mormon studies classes, you know, where we, where we talk about various authors. We talk about, particularly in philosophy, the suffering uh, of the world, and then we talk about, we bring in some, some Mormon elements about suffering. And, and the best we could get to was, you know, God suffers as well. It's another process theology commonality, right? But we couldn't really ever get past that kind of surface detail that, yeah, God suffers too. Uh, but how awful is that suffering, right? I mean, would that change God's conception of the world? Um, or is God, in a sense, suffers awfully, but at the same time is indifferent enough to be able to function as a God? Right, So he's able to kind of just put it in the back of his brain just enough that he's able to be the God that we need God to be. Okay, um, We'll get a little more into this at the very end, particularly if there's any time at all. Okay, Now, three concepts from Eugene Thacker okay, that he wants us to think about. For the first is the concept of the world. And the world is the human world, the world for us, the world as it exists for our benefit and our understanding. Okay. This is the world that we, deal, that we deal with. And we often want to think that this is the only world, okay? The world that is to our benefit and that, and that we understand through human eyes. But there's also what he calls the earth, which is the world in itself, okay? That's geology and meteorology and zoology, okay? The world as is experienced by non-humans, okay? And finally, there's the planet, which is the world without us. Now, the world without us is a subset of the world in itself. Obviously, it's not experienced by humans, but the world without us is, ex is explicitly indifferent to humanity, so much so that it's dangerous to humanity, okay? And this is where a lot of the strangeness and catastrophe part of the unthinkability of the world I already talked about comes in, okay? Kind of have to move along a little quickly, okay? This is Lugati again on, on cosmic pessimism. Uh, I'm gonna read this one, this is, this is pretty important. As for us humans, we reek of our own sense of being something. Nature proceeds by blunders, that is its way, it is also ours. So if we have blundered by regarding consciousness as a blunder, why make a fuss over it? Our self-removal from this planet would still be a magnificent move, a feat so luminous it would be dim the sun. What do we have to lose? No evil would attend our departure from this world, and the many evils we have known would go extinct along with us. So why put off what would be the most laudable masterstroke of our existence and the only one? Okay, oh, right? Okay, but this is important because this, if you could take the opposite of transhumanism, at least as I've understood it, and kind of uh, disseminate it into one paragraph, that might be what this paragraph looks like, okay? Okay, this is, I mean, this is essentially saying, um, what? Then you've won, yeah. Okay, but that's, but that's where the battle is. That's where my point is, right? That's, that's where the philosophical rubber meets the road, okay? It's, it's not in the, the details, in the technology or the ethics. It's in the actual, uh, the actual logical feasibility, right? Okay? All right, let me just move to the end here since time is technically gone. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Cosmic pessimism, this is kind of the same. Now, this is, this is, a, this is Thacker which, who basically says, look, uh, pessimism in America, especially, is completely foreign, right? We we can't even we can't even begin to confront the pessimist without wanting to exile him or her immediately, <laughs> right? The pessimist has no place in our society whatsoever, right? Um, 
To live in such a culture is to constantly live in the shadow of an obligatory optimism, a novel type of coercion that is pathologized early on in child education and the assessment do not play, does not like to play with others. Okay. Okay. Oops, that's a weird slide. Okay, there, okay, two more slides. Okay. So the horror philosophy, this is kind of it distilled, only in that brief moment of absolute uncertainty when both options seem equally plausible or implausible, when neither thought can be accepted or rejected, when everything can be explained and nothing can be explained, only in that moment do we really have this horror of philosophy, this questioning of the principle of sufficient reason. Okay, so Thacker wants to kind of twist the knife a little bit to say um, we, are, we are often too optimistic in our optimism, too optimistic in what we think we understand about the world and, and the whole causal chain that gets to our ability to understand in the first place. Okay, so the horror of transhumanism, if you were to overlay that onto transhumanism is the uncertain valuation of the worth of humanity. Now, Ligotti will say humanity is totally worthless, or at least no more or less worthless than anything else, right? But there's also gradations here as well. Thacker would probably say, oh, we're still worth something, but far, far less than we want to believe that we're worth, particularly when you put us into the mix with the world in itself and the world without us. Okay, as we, as we ultimately have to do. So that would be what Thacker would say. And finally, the horror of Mormonism. Now this is Ligotti quoting uh, one of his favorite authors who's even more pessimistic than he is, if, if you can believe it. Okay, and, and, and this will be my last point. Okay, what is the horror of Mormonism as it relates to itself theologically? If something like God exists or once existed, what would he not be capable of doing or undoing? Why should God not want to be done with himself because unbeknownst to us, suffering was the essence of his being. Why should he not have brought forth a universe that is one great puppet show, which is destined by him to be crunched or scattered until an absolute nothingness has been established? God is really kind of of this earth in the sense that God is corporeal and that God suffers in the same way that we suffer. And importantly, that if we were to become gods, would that really entail just uh, an eternity of reproduction and you know, dancing and singing together? Or would it be doing what God and Christ have been doing for as long as we've known about, which is sitting in the blood and the mud with humanity and trying to save some people, right? If that's what gods do and that's what we would do, then what do we look for, have to look forward to as immortal beings is essentially a life of suffering, okay? Now, that suffering might be couched in, in, in a huge context of meaning, and there might be joy associated with it, which we couldn't understand without the suffering, et cetera. But nevertheless, that, that, that kind of deification is somewhat horrific, the horror, right, to contemplate. If being a god means anything at all like we understand God to be, and if being God means that you are with your creation in all of their horrific suffering, then there's not a place of rest that we have to look forward to, at least not ultimately, okay? Um, and that kind of bleeds into this principle of, uh, is the principle of sufficient reason sufficient? Well, maybe not. Um, is immortality a good? Maybe it isn't. Or maybe it's an inevitability and we just have to get used to the fact that it's an inevitability and it's not a good, right? Okay, so that's, that's basically it. Thanks.